watching in my news podcast this is Fatma Suhail and today we have amazing Duran with us she is the founder and CEO of Stiller how are you Naran hi <laughs> hi hi uh, I'm very proud to be here and thank you for having me yeah it's an absolute honor and like you said we finally made it <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean we've been uh, we've been talking for a very long time. Yeah. We went through emails and LinkedIn, and um, we're finally doing this. Um, yeah. And for me, it's it's very interesting what you guys are doing and Invozone as well. Um, so I'm I'm really proud that we have uh, we've made it here finally. Yeah. So uh, before starting uh, uh, formally, I want to know about you. How did you uh, entered in this technology world and uh, how did you made it? Tell me about yourself. Um, okay, um, I didn't make it yet, but I'll tell you more about myself. <laughs> um, my name is Nuran Ghanem, and Nunu is uh, short to find me wherever you are in the world. It's uh, organic search uh, improvements. Um, so I started off studying as a political science student and political economy. So I'm very far from the entrepreneurship world. Uh, but during 2011, with the Arab Spring and the revolutions, I saw that a lot of power can come from people. And I saw what it means to um, to be independent, to be um, different. And these things were playing a big role in my mind. So it was great as a political science student, obviously, but uh, I thought there was more uh, to that. And that's when I started looking at entrepreneurship and startups, whereby you can create something for the uh, country or the region that you're in or the world that you're in and at the same time benefit yourself um, so this was very attractive to me solving problems and crises and challenges and opportunities and um, not just in the sense of doing as well but also receiving something back um, ju just making sure that you live uh, you're well off you know you're living uh, well as as well and all um, ever since I started uh, my studies and I was uh, raised in the Gulf I just saw the commonalities between the different regions and I got exposed to all these different cultures, you know, from East to West. Um, and I just saw the things that people can do together. I, I started, you know, jumping into the entrepreneurship scene and startups as a program manager. I also worked, I always had two jobs. Uh, so at university, I was on a scholarship and I was an RA and a TA. So always, um, Something I say to myself as a as a young woman, if there are any young women watching, financial independence is step one in anything. Okay, can't talk if you don't make money. <laughs> make money, and uh, it, it does work. So, um, financial independence is really good. Um, so I started with that. I was working, feeding myself, buying my books. Um, and that's how I started getting used to different um, exposure and working with all these different companies. The sweet spot that I found was that I was a very good um, car, uh, uh, marketeer and content creator. Um, and I was able to help brands and companies do that. And then I joined Instabug. Um, and then after that, I was in a startup called Basid. And, now, and then I started Startups Galaxy, which gives all access, like a directory of all um, regional startups, um, Pakistan included, by the way, um, on startupsgalaxy.com, a very um, community-based, crunch-based, uh, basically. And then uh, Stellar Network uh, began uh, in December 2021 as a freelancing platform, focusing on marketing and content teams, because um, the belief is um, these gigs are not a one person job they require two people three people four people so instead of opening up an agency you can just work with different teams and this was better so um for me i feel like my like my north star metric as a person is helping the region that i'm in um you know the south region the east um you know the, what they call the mina or mina etc um, this is where I feel my most fulfillment. It's uh, really the best place to be in the world right now. It's where it has the most challenges and opportunities and has the ability to turn into something good. And these convergence can bring to you um, even your own personal wealth, uh, which is never a bad thing to add uh, because, you know, you need some uh, breathing space so you can continue your journey. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You need some space to continue your journey. Um uh, Nuran, from your discussion, uh, I have um, the question came in my mind 
is that why only marketing i understand that you are uh, use your idea that you are a content creator but no, why not developers uh, why your platform uh, if you don't mind me asking is just oh, you, uh, you can ask me any question by the way <laughs> any question <laughs> that's very sweet of you uh, it's uh, it's only for marketing people or do you have plans of extending it towards uh, the development side toward developers okay um so we started in marketing and content in terms of development we are just focusing on wordpress and webflow and things like that um these are the main needs of our um of the partners and clients that we work with uh the reason we haven't gone right into the tech part is because uh we, we see a lot of great players already doing that um mm -hmm. so there isn't much of a market gap for example there isn't something that hasn't been done already so we think that um, maybe working with partnerships in tech could be good, but we're more going to be focusing on uh, marketing and content. It's a $427 billion industry. If we finish it, we'll definitely jump to next things. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot. Um, I'm, I'm open to, to any category, really, but uh, I prefer categories that... Um, uh, are not uh, are not well developed in the team sphere um, and, and it's actually if you think about it the way we look at the marketing and content freelancing and what we do is similar to the um, agile squad in uh, when you have a back end and a front end and UI UX and a tester you know that same um, idea is very um, uh, influence uh, is a very big influence to um, how things are in Stellar um, so I feel like um there are existing players that are doing a good job. Um, so we prefer, you know, being their, um, their um, complementary. Um, there might be new categories coming up, uh, but we're seeing, for example, uh, people uh, more interested in asking about PR, um, in which they're not so familiar with uh, how to get PR freelancers, um, distribution freelancers. Uh, but of course, because we focus on quality, um, these are the kinds of, uh, things we're seeing our uh, partners move into. Um, so our extensions coming up may be things in PR, uh, maybe things um, in um, content could become like 3D video, videography, photography, um, events, photography, offline uh, events, creation, um, stuff like that. So we're more into the $427 billion industry. That's like our main focus right now. That's good to know. It's a big industry and I believe that it is going to expand more in the coming decade or so. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, think about like, okay, think about in Pakistan, like how many marketeers or agencies, you know, and how many things you would need to move from a person to another. So the MarTech element of Stellar is that you work with that full team. Some of them, by the way, are agencies in their teams that they are working through Stellar. Um, and people don't know how to choose between different agencies. So that's kind of what we're fixing um, when we recommend to you or uh, we're, we're helping you get the right budget so you don't pay, pay overheads or um, additional things like that. So you have one uh, platform that takes you from just taking one freelancer to two to three, four to a full team. And we're starting to move towards um, towards bigger projects, enterprise, compliance, um, add-ons, et cetera, that really smooth in like any project scope. Oh, that's kind of nice. Uh, how do you connect people uh, like in a uh, correct agency with correct freelancers? Is there technology involved like artificial intelligence, machine learning? Uh, how does a uh, platform decides that this is the right agency to be connected with the right freelancer? Mm -hmm. um, so the first item is first um, giving it access to data from both uh, from both ends. Oh. And um, in order to reach a good level of machine learning or artificial intelligence, it's also very important to map out the actual data. So data collection, data scrapping, um, you know, patterns, etc. So we are in the in the in the sphere now of collecting patterns, but I wouldn't say that I can trust the machine to um, come back and give you better feedback or better recommendations. We're more into the stage before that in the collection phase, um, monitoring um, certain happenings, monitoring uh, attributes or events or movements, etc. That's kind of the step where we are right now. So we're still in the in the beginning, I would say, uh, right before we just uh, um, have a proper AI machine learning. We're actually we're doing it, but we're in the phase before. Oh, that's nice. Uh, 
actually uh, ai uh, is kind of uh, i have seen many platforms uh, like uh, stellar uh, stellar is of course very unique uh, but it is a kind of thing that ai is powering almost kind of everything right now uh, from health tech to martech to every industry what do you think about that where do you see ai in freelance industry Absolutely, you're absolutely right. And um, you can see what it uh, it does. There's a great book that I started, by the way, uh, reading, and I would recommend if anyone's listening to start when you're hearing all about AI and you feel like uh, uh, you don't know, there's a, a, a very great book, um, Introduction to AI for Beginners. Um, it just takes you through the whole process. And it's good for CEOs who are um, not a uh, tech background to also understand what it means and the kind of things to do because a lot of CEOs now when startups are like they go to their CTOs and their founders like make me AI like uh, what <laughs> in what where how what data like you know you need to you need to answer these questions so that these um, books and reading um, you know understanding how AI works is really good and uh, Google uh, TensorFlow um, also I think has some videos on YouTube um, and using AWS as well has videos. So just first of all, like the learning part is important. And um, how I see AI in the freelancing space, uh, there's a m multiple ways. And, um, you know, the first and the first thing people always go to is the matchmaking, like, you know, the recommendations and everything. And that's usually the case if you have a big number of recommendations. So here are the best of the best. So the recommendation engine is sort of uh, um, relevant if you have like over a hundred thousand people or you have like this huge number of people and anyone who comes in are is going to be lost sort of like what upwork or fiverr or other platforms they have plenty of people so they recommend based on what they think is good for you um for me there's a lot more usage um than simply like a matchmaking or a search engine um so i have a lot of things that have to do as well um that are being tested in pricing so pricing is being tested, like, for example, on Booking or Airbnb um, with Uber as well with search. Like if you go on Uber, if there's a lot of people requesting Uber, then they increase the price. They don't recommend you the nearest Uber. They recommend you actually the most expensive one because you are most likely to be in need. So because there is a price, price inelasticity, the more people need, the higher the price. So I won't match make you. I will just look for automatically those who will are willing to pay an increase in price. And even if it's a longer ride for Uber to go pick you up, but you're the one who's willing to pay a higher price. So that's the trip that wins. Mm. So there's a lot of ways like booking. Uh, they detect, uh, um, I think there are flights as well and and, and uh, air travel. They detect if you've been checking the, 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 the ticket for more than one time, they'll increase the price because uh, we know you're going on holiday soon or you're traveling back home. Hmm. So that's it, you know, Halas, thank you for telling me your details. So it's not about finding the best um, or cheapest uh, air travel or uh, cheapest uh, ride. It's uh, who's going to pay the most. So it's like a bid. And I think with Marsul, they do like a bid uh, system as well. If you want a captain to deliver a package from A to B, it's a bidding system. So uh, the bidding system, I it's part of pricing. And that is all also uh, powered by AI. Um, so that's an also great method to use in the freelancing space to the, using the gig economy and service economy um, and looking at digital platforms as using AI for bidding, for pricing, pricing optimization, uh, not just matchmaking and recommendations. Mm, you're right. Uh, from uh, our discussion, um, for I will move towards more AI, but I really want to know the genesis story of uh, Stellar. Uh, like... Uh, okay. Do you did you had a team when you started? Were you alone, or were you just said that I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna change this industry? Mm -hmm. Um. So um, I started with my co-founder uh, Ahmed. Uh, we are a team now. We started as a small team of four, um, and then we're now uh, about eleven. Uh, we have hundreds of freelancers and um, dozens of companies using Stellar. But how it started was I did get uh, to see how um, freelancing and consulting works, um, not in small gigs, but more in long term, like, you know, months, projects, quarterly projects, yearly projects. And this was the segment that I didn't see a platform solving. So the gigs are sort of like, you know, Fiverr. And then you have the biggest agencies, you know, like McKinsey or uh 
uh, Boston Group Consulting with like the biggest um, um, consulting um, projects. And then the middle is sort of like nothing, you know, the, sort of the middle is like agencies, you know, referrals, but the small gigs, you, you go to Fiverr, you go to like any other um, part. So it, it's just of the project size that I didn't feel like there was a solution. And I felt like, how big is this industry? So in marketing, is it's spent outsourced marketing is a $427 billion industry. And that's the, these are the ones that are captured. And up to 40% of a company spends, uh, uh, sorry, companies spend up to 40% of their budgets on outsourcing and marketing and freelancers and agencies and, and, and. So there's this lot of mix up and you don't know the clear ROI of freelancing. Um, so for me, it was really accustomed to uh, freelancing because it's things I did as well. Like I told you, I'm always like financially independent is very important for me and very important for everyone. Um, yeah. So this is something that I did uh, and uh, I didn't want just the largest amount of projects. I want consistent projects. I wanted quality projects. And um, that's that that was stellar. Like um, I just said, like, you know, um, this is a very big opportunity for the region. Um, the South division of the world is is very much a source of outsourcing, you know, from the Philippines, India, Pakistan, um, Egypt, even Eastern Europe, even um, Africa, you know, the, with, with the increase of the knowledge of technology and and therefore uh, these things need to get higher exposure um, through marketing and content were sort of um, made me feel like, you know, this is a very big opportunity to create great economic prosperity for the region and for the uh, for the developing countries through outsourcing that's consistent, that's actually quality and provides a good living for people um, in MENAP. Yeah, that's true. Uh, freelancing has helped people a lot. And I guess uh, after COVID, freelancing has increased a lot too. Uh, it has provided people opportunities towards better life. You're completely right in that. Um, as Teller is connected with marketing and you guys have technology, so uh, it's a combo of market, MarTech, I guess. And I want to know uh, in Egypt, how uh, MarTech industry is doing in Egypt? Because in Europe, I come across startups that are solely like MarTech and it is booming. But how uh, Martech is doing in Egypt? That's what I am really interested in knowing. Wow. Okay. Um. So Martech is very diverse. So we're um people see us more of more than tech, and um some people are more tech than more, and some people are half and half. So I see ourselves half and half. So moving towards more of the the tech um in Mar Martech, I see a lot of great uh, startups in Egypt creating um solutions in the SaaS. Uh, style. So Martech SaaS, uh, not Martech Marketplace, Martech SaaS. So Martech SaaS, I can say really good examples. Um, converted in, converted in is a platform uh, built uh, on top of AI for any e-commerce store to automate their ads um, just by uploading the list of um, designs and content and everything. And then they actually make the best mix to the best platforms and bring in a greater ROI for companies. Uh, you have game ball game ball is a retention uh tool uh for also you know it's possible for enterprise and for e-commerce stores um through a gaming and a loyalty program to make your users stay uh stay more retained and onboarded um so these are the two biggest martech uh startups that come to to come to mind um they're absolutely great people Muhammad Fergani is from as the CEO of Converted In and uh, Ahmad Khairi from uh, from Gameball and these are two very beautiful people who are doing great great marketing uh mark martech uh, martech startups especially in the SaaS so i'm seeing a lot of martech SaaS in Egypt coming to play yeah uh, except, uh martech is also and i um, we have a lot of startups in connection with us and i'm really excited to know that egypt is booming in terms of health tech especially fintech too yeah absolutely yeah fintech, fintech is doing absolutely great yeah fintech martech like startups like your your startups stellar uh, so uh, what do you think that uh, how stiller do what do you imagine stiller to be in four to five years 
So I imagine (laughs) very briefly, right? I can talk about it. Um, So I see Stellar as a neighborhood for collaboration uh, where you can come in and see, uh, collaborate uh, with different teams and different people. So the way I imagine Stellar in five years is becoming a very um, large freelance region on how that I envision it to happen is empowering the freelancers with lots of tools that help them, you know, convert more on projects and almost like opening up cloud agencies. So if every freelancer is able to open up a cloud agency and our academy, which is involved in training and and, and development um, for Stellar, is really increasing the amount of work we do, I hope that in five years we can at least reach um, economic prosperity for one million. Yeah, that's a noble cause, I guess. <laughs> because uh, empowering people, especially women, uh, being uh, financially independent is so much more important, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's um, it's uh, it's important for anyone um, in in regions that usually have troubled times, uh, war, uh, yeah. civil unrest, uh, mm-hmm. things like this. It's so just you know, sort of create, um, you know what, you know, shut yourself out of um, mm. some of the things in your ecosystem, focus on what you can do. And no one's going to give you money or not if you're not really, you know, helping their company or helping their business. So try providing value to people, you know, comes first before you can ask for anything. Um, so this is really important as well. And I hope that uh, providing value to this region is, is worth something. And um, I believe that it's happening. That's good. Um... I'm really inspired, Nuran, by you, <laughs> and uh, I I really want to know that what would you say to the women who are right now uh, trying to enter the startup space or are still figuring it out? What would you say to them? Um, so I usually have two um, two things that I want to uh, say to them, and the first thing is. Um, I have uh, a, a certain health condition and it's very popular with uh, with women and it could be um, disabling. And as a woman in this region, you know, you can hold enough on your plate what's happening and then somehow life adds another, you know, like, you know, like take this, you know, take this slap as well, take this bullet. <laughs> so um, never feel disadvantaged, disadvantaged as a woman, in fact, um, use your strengths of your uh, thinking, your analytical thinking, your personality. So don't uh, don't give up to um, the fight of uh, of the things around you, even if it's personal, even if they are uh, really harsh on you, even if life is really harsh on you. You know, just uh, don't let it get to you, um, and just keep going. And um, the second thing that I always um, like to say in startups and entrepreneurship uh, for men and women that um, starting is just as the same as joining. Um, and I definitely, um, so I get, for example, for example, um, if five people talk to me uh, about wanting to speak to Nuno, the CEO of Stellar, uh, one of them I take and four of them I give my other team to talk about Stellar and about what they do. Um, in many of the events, I think the last one I posted on LinkedIn was about a month ago. Um, I was invited to to, um, to the to AUC to give uh, to the MBA class, and um, I invited the CTO and Maryam, who's the product manager of the academy, to join. Um, I think the Chinese university in Egypt invited me. I actually passed it on to Yesel, who's uh, the associate product marketing manager. Um, so I don't feel like I'm the I'm the you know the 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 the, the person who is supposed to do anything or everything. And in fact, I feel like um, the other founding team is just as important. So for anyone who is looking to join the startups and enter entrepreneurship world, it's just as noble and just as great to look at visions and missions that you really like and joining them could give them the fuel and the battery that they need to continue because cars are useless without gas. So you can be gas. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. You're right. That uh, your internal passion is much more important, I guess, uh, in doing anything in life. You can achieve anything in life if you have that kind of energy and passion uh, and a zeal to go on, go on, despite of whatever comes your way. Absolutely. So um, for now, for Stellar, uh, 
uh, do you, uh, by looking at the uh, market and the other platforms, uh, you think that I should add this to Stellar, this particular feature to Stellar, or this particular functionality in the Stellar? Do you think that, or to make it more unique? Mm -hmm. Um, so the way I look at uh, feature uh, for Stellar, um, I used to look at it as launch, um, you know, market for it, iterate, you know, launch. Um, now the best uh, way to look at uh, um, feature feature launch or feature adoption is to uh, examine, and this is always a good tip I say to to companies: examine your um, customer support issues. Like read your all your customer support, read all your WhatsApps, your intercoms, your talk to all, all the actual um, issues of customers, read all of them, have interviews with them. Now, um, customers lie. OK, so talking to them, they might tell you, oh, my God, if you just do this feature, my life will change. Don't listen to them. If they don't complain about it in customer support, it's not worth actually opening up the topic with them. Like, don't ask people for feature ideas and then they upvote. It's good, you know, if you're in a in, in other regions, maybe in the Western culture, they're like, I'm going to upvote the true need for this feature. But in other regions, I, I think of like the Middle East, you know, people are just like always very excited. Um, so they just upvote everything. Um, so it makes you back to step one. So don't adopt ideas that are maybe working for Western communities the same way, learn from it and adapt to it. So for things like upvoting feature requests, um, first look at customer support tickets, look at why they're angry in the first place. Think of three, four solutions, go back to these users. Which one would you like more? One, two, three, or four. That's the one you do. You have, you have the exact feedback from them. You have the number of issues. Like we have 20 issues here, but we have 300 issues in this. Take the 300, make a brainstorming session, put out all your solutions and features, go back and say, hey guys, I don't want to know your opinion, but I would love to know if you can, one, two, three, four would be the most helpful to you. That's the feature, that's the feature, that's a roadmap, basically. As for uh, new things, um, you always see new things, but you always have to like, first think about it, uh, especially with um, the inflation rates that we're seeing, um, are things like crypto. Um, so yeah. either um, pay by crypto or, um, you know, get your payouts in crypto. Uh, so these, these are very interesting things for me. Um, and I feel like, um, you know, they're going to, they're the future, right? But um, like the first step, they, they have to keep going. If they stop, everyone's going to be like, ah, I told you so crypto sucks. But they're going to keep going. <laughs> and if they keep going, they'll make it. Uh, same with NFT. I think uh, most NFTs lost like 90% of their value this year. Um, so they're going to keep going. And if they keep going, they will they will be better. And then they can. Um, this will affect our um, insights into the roadmap of uh, payment infrastructure and, and looking at uh, Web3 uh, payments. Um, so this is something that uh, I'm looking at. So sometimes... You have to go back to your users and see what's the actual problem and uh, adapt to that. And sometimes you need to look way further into the future and you know bring it back to you. But never always look too far into the future and never too far behind. Mm, that's a great advice. <laughs> I hope it helps. <laughs> I hope <Sure>. it helps. <laughs> uh, uh, you talked about the blockchain uh, industry. Uh, what do you think, how blockchain industry uh, can change the freelancing market uh, in Egypt? Uh, we can say that it can add more transparency in terms of exchange of fine payments, etc. Uh, how do you think it can further change on this industry? Mm -hmm. um, so with blockchain, I think uh, there could be a lot used with verification, authentication of people's um, uh, people's IDs or personalities or who they are. Um, that is definitely one of the things that you can use is for identification and authorization. Uh, but also what can be used actually is um, protecting and encrypting the data that's being transferred between the companies and the freelancers, because a lot of things that happen is um, the protection of data becomes very important because at the end of the day, as a company, you're kind of giving out your credentials and everything to someone you barely know. So is this person really to be trusted? Is this person someone you can rely on giving your company assets or company accounts or sometimes, you know, um, company credit cards? So 
freelancing really requires for you to keep it limited. So companies are only exposed to the best people who are really trusted. And that's something that's very important. And a layer that can add this authentication um, is, is definitely blockchain. You're, you're completely right. Um, thank you, Nuran. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, I enjoyed so our conversation a lot. Uh, I hope thank we can uh, again invite you to the podcast. Sure. Thank you. Um, for anyone listening, I just please uh, add me on LinkedIn. And as I said, I changed my name uh, uh, to Nunu so people can easily find me. So <laughs> N-O-N-O, uh, Nunu Ghanem, just find me on LinkedIn. Um, Instagram is uh, just call me Nunu. If you search for just call me Nunu, uh, you will find me. Um, please get in touch. I'm very, very happy to help anyone who has any questions or anything. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. And it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you.